Thank you for joining us. So we're going to be talking about AI and drones, and we're going to be doing it in a little bit of a different way than uh, drones have been discussed in the, uh, yesterday and, and earlier today. We heard uh, from SkyGrid around how do you safely integrate drones in the national airspace. We heard from Verizon around how drones can uh, take advantage of 5G capabilities, but today we're going to talk about drones more as, you know, as fun, as entertainment, and as sport, which is really what DRL has, has created. So, uh, James, maybe you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what DRL is. Absolutely. Uh, James Slider, I'm the director of special projects for the Drone Racing League. Uh, and for those who don't know the Drone Racing League or DRL, we are the premier global circuit for first-person view drone racing. And that's where you take uh, a competitive racing quadcopter. It has a first-person view camera on the front of it that pilots can see through. Um, and then pilots navigate complex 3D courses at up to 90 miles an hour. We produce this into TV content, um, which airs on previously on ESPN. And then this year, we're on NBC and also on uh, Twitter. You might have seen our content. And then this year, we're making an additional transition into uh, the AI space. Excellent. And for full disclosure, you know, Hearst is an investor in DRL. And if you haven't seen any of the DRL competitions or any of the, the media out there, it's, it's really quite compelling. It's a very, very cool event. And I can certainly understand why some people are, are calling it sort of the next generation of sport. So when you think about the pilots who run these races, uh, they have incredible spatial awareness, incredible spatial reasoning skills, uh, you know, fast twitch reactions. Uh, it's a very skilled pilot base. And so what, what was the impetus for, for creating sort of autonomous pilots? Yeah, there are a couple of things that play into that. So about a year ago, uh, we entered into a partnership with Lockheed Martin. They launched a series of innovation challenges. So they wanted to launch one around autonomous flight. Uh, we're speaking to one of our investors. We're thinking about doing this thing, you know. And one of our investors said, "You know, we know guys who do that. We can we can connect you with them." So Lockheed had this vision of creating an autonomous flight challenge, and we have a great heritage of uh, drone racing technology, and not an easy thing to pin down. You pin a live production on top of an entire drone racing stack, um, so it's pretty unique what we do. And then we've been able to take a lot of that heritage tech, combine it with new. Uh, information tech, and then influence from the Lockheed side to bring an AI element into that. Mm -hmm. And so born from that, we have this circuit called AIR, AI Robotic Racing. We have nine different teams from around the globe. Uh, we started with 424, down-selected those to nine final teams through a series of tests. We gave them tests on computer vision, uh, simulation technology, and then general kind of strategy and, and personality measures to make sure that the folks we're onboarding are up to the challenge. We have our nine final teams, um, and then they have the chance to program AI tech uh, in a racing format. Excellent. Could you talk maybe a little bit more about Alpha Pilot and, and Air and, and, and that combination? Yeah, most definitely. So Alpha Pilot is a global search for AI programming talent, um, and that is Lockheed Martin's Innovation Challenge. On the other side of this, we have Air, which is a unique tech stack produced by DRL. So the Air platform is an autonomous development uh, effort. So we created a custom IDE, a development kit, uh, an autonomy simulator with hardware in the loop simulation uh, powered by NVIDIA's Xavier. So the teams get that to develop their autonomous technology on. And then on the racing side, uh, we have uh, drone tech like the Racer AI sitting right next to me, which we just launched in October. So this has got two sets of seroscopic cameras, um, also has a number of different sensory inputs like IMU, LiDAR, all these things that give the drone different percepts around its surroundings. Those feed into an NVIDIA Xavier. And then each team's algorithm uh, works on the Xavier to decide how to execute against what it's seeing on the course. And we design custom and different courses and challenges for each, each kind of race or level that the teams will be put up against. Maybe the first one is fairly simple and linear, and then we go to a little bit more of an S shape, and eventually we'll go to you know, some more complex geometries that you might see on a human racing course. Mm -hmm. And when you, anytime you introduce sort of a Z axis, you know, it, it's, it's a lot more difficult. There's a lot of engineering challenges. It's not just like self-driving cars where, you know, they're always rooted on the ground. You have to deal with gravity and stability. Uh, and then you have to deal with, you know, the weight of sensors and all the engineering challenges to, to still make it maneuverable and, and airworthy. Can you talk about some of the, the, the tech uh, innovations that you've kind of come across to kind of make this possible? Yeah, so we, we had to do a lot of work in thinking about what are the kind of tools that a human racing pilot has to take into account. It's their, it's their eyes and the loop down to their hands. So in first-person view racing, pilots are equipped with a, 
a small set of goggles um, that let them see what the drone is seeing. And basically, they take that percept loop, that cycles to their hands, which are controlling the drone. So we had to recreate all of that on board on, in one kind of drone fixture. And what we landed on was two sets of stereo cameras to give as much kind of peripheral vision as we can, a powerful GPU processor uh, to run through and chew through that data as quickly as possible, and then a kind of suite of other sensors uh, to replicate that. And I think we're seeing some good adoption and use of those sensors, but it's very much in its infancy. Uh, and you can almost see it when the drones are performing. We go from this kind of slow, like bumbling forward crawling, and then now we're getting faster and faster, and we're, we're crashing less. I mean, everyone loves a good crash, mm -hmm. um, but we also like to see the drones succeed. Personally, as someone who helps oversee the teams that put the drones together, I hate to see them smash to pieces, um, although the audience does love that as well. Right. <laughs> so what are the, some of the, the sort of surprising approaches you found in, like, the, in the algorithms that, 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 that these teams are, are implementing, you know, sort of the design strategies to sort of navigate through the course in, in a short amount of time? Yeah, it's been a really interesting exercise. So uh, typically in the DRL format, we have 16 professional pilots who compete, and they have relatively the same set of needs. But when you're designing a technology platform for team-based competition, each team has a little bit different approach, and therefore a little bit different need uh, set on the sensor side, on the computational side. They want to see different things with weight and balance on the drone. So we tried to make something that kind of worked for everyone. But in terms of strategy, um, some teams we see doing a heavy level of visual odometry. Uh, some do more dead reckoning. We've seen teams literally just pick up the drone and rocket it forward as fast mm -hmm. as they can, trying to make through as many gates as they can. I can't say that strategy has a lot of longevity to it as the courses get more complex. Um, but it's been fascinating to see teams take this as a tool and then figure out the resources they need to succeed. Some of them have been generating their own deep learning libraries of gates and trajectories to learn against. Um, some of them have taken the actual mechanics or drone fixture and performed their own tests in lab against finding the, the right thrust curve and maneuverability. Um, so every team is kind of using this tool a little bit differently. Got it. Uh, and the, how are the races sort of instrumented? You know, sort of is there a, a standard kind of, are you marking gates in a way that's easier for the, the drones to do the perception and understand how to navigate? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, in my understanding, this is probably the only format in the world that is, the production design is based on computer vision compatibility. So we took a lot of what we do for the human races. Um, and in human races, we do some pretty extreme things. You might have a 150-foot climb to a dive back down. And that's just not where we're at with, with AI or autonomy flight right now. So we've simplified the trajectories a little bit. Um, all of the gates are the same design. And at the onset of the season, we took that gate design, put it in a warehouse, took 10,000 pictures of it from different angles and gave that to the teams as a starter kind of database. I can tell you that process is pretty painful. Um, but it was a, a good learning for us uh, and for everyone involved about what it takes to get this off the ground. So we take these kind of simplistic trajectories and computer vision designed elements, which have sharp kind of acute um, computer vision friendly designs to them. We add those in, and then as the season goes on, we're making those courses harder and harder and harder as we see teams step up to make it through two gates, three gates, four gates, faster and faster. Yeah, so one of the obvious comparisons uh, is to you know, the, the DARPA Grand Challenge, which I think launched in, in 2004. If you go on YouTube, there's some really great kind of fail videos of these you know, motorcycles and, 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 and Jeeps just you know, not having any idea how to navigate that course. They'll go you know, uh, you know, 20 feet and stop because there's a hay bale in the middle of the road or a shadow will, uh, will confuse their navigation system. You know, what, what do you think about sort of the learning curve and you know, getting to a, a point where they're really kind of competent and really navigating these courses with, with actual skill that might begin to approximate you know, uh, you know, uh, a, a not very highly skilled human pilot? Yeah, so the, these teams started coding about five months ago. Um, and in the first race in October in Orlando, we saw four teams make it through a gate, one team make it through two gates. And I think there's something uniquely accessible and a little bit disarming about that. People think, you know, AI and drones, maybe it's a little bit intimidating until you see a drone just bumble forward, hit a gate, and fall over. And maybe then it's less intimidating as a, a concept. Um, but we've seen massive improvement already in the last three to four weeks as teams get more time on the hardware. Um, in our race in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago, we had two different drones complete the course in its entirety, which mm. is 100% better than we saw at the first race a couple of weeks before that. So I think that curve is going to continue to follow a, a pretty dramatic trajectory upward. 
as people figure out how to use the tool more effectively and get more time on the hardware. Got it. And what are, what are the teams kind of uh, comprised of? Are they, are they generally college students? What's the sort of the demographic makeup of the teams who are participating? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of college student teams. Um, our teams are pretty globally diverse. We have three in the U.S., California, uh, Atlanta, and then one from Pittsburgh. But then we've also got representation from Brazil, um, from Munich, from Zurich, all over the kind of uh, globe. So it's been cool to see what each of those different academic programs brings to this too. Some of them have a really strong heritage of autonomous drone racing. Some are in robotics, and then they have a more of a theoretical understanding of AI, and they try to merge those two together. Um, obviously, the teams that have more of a heritage in flight autonomy specifically are stronger competitors from the onset. Uh, but as we see teams get more time uh, deploying and coding and testing, that starts to kind of level out. That advantage doesn't matter as much. Got it, yeah. And from a sort of development perspective, what are some of the, the, the sensors and the development platforms that you're making available? You mentioned the NVIDIA uh, GPUs. What other sort of tools are you making available to that community? Yeah, so every team gets a, a custom uh, IDE and development environment, as well as a simulator made by DRL. And then they also get basically a sensor replica of this drone. So they're doing most of their training and learning on uh, replicated hardware and then in simulation. But we give them a couple of tools to deploy on the actual hardware as well. So we have um, an deployment in Colorado in partnership with Lockheed where they send in their code, we deploy it, we send them the videos, crashes, successes, whatever it might be, send them sensor data. We hosted a three-day developer summit uh, in conjunction with MIT where the teams got to come on site, work with our team, Lockheed's team, and MIT experts to learn about flight autonomy, what succeeds, what doesn't succeed, and how to best kind of move forward. Mm -hmm. And you're finding that simulation approach, are you getting strong gains that way? And obviously in the, the autonomous vehicle industry, simulation, getting access to data is incredibly important. You have a much more constrained operating environment. Talk a little bit more about sort of like how the, the simulation environment is in, in encouraging more technical advances. Yeah, most definitely. So I think DRL has a strong uh, consumer simulator for the human-based flight for quadcopters. I've had a number of folks talk to me about that's a very high fidelity and they're very impressed with the quality of it. When you get into autonomy, it's a kind of a different animal. You're not just going by tactile feel, which a human can give you feedback on. It's an actual percept loop where you're taking in uh, sensory information from the environment, feeding it into your processing engine and seeing what the fidelity actually is. So I would say that's been a big learning for us. Um, you can't necessarily lean on physics capabilities that a gaming engine might give you, which you could get buy on for human racing, you have to take that to another level and make sure that the level of data you're providing into that loop is, is really good. Could you elaborate on, on why Lockheed is sort of inter particularly interested in a sort of AI uh, pilots in this project? So I think a lot of this for, for Lockheed and for DRL as well is about creating access accessibility into autonomy. So you have this kind of intangible, maybe a little bit scary concept. And this is a great way through entertainment and sport to bring that back into the public. We host a series of public races where we do great STEM activations, we do pre-show kind of entertainment, and then we intersperse different speaking panels where uh, guests can talk about AI theoretically or in application, and we put autonomous drone racing between those so they can see it. It's tangible, it's visceral, uh, and you can actually see the teams that are creating the technology uh, and make it a little bit more accessible and less intimidating to the average public uh, who might be more intrigued and uh, you know, more likely to become involved once they've seen this first person and what it can do and what it can look like. Got it, so it's a great live event experience. It's not just the race, there's sort of AI content and discussion and networking going on. What sort of a typical sort of attendance for one of these uh, air events? Yeah, so I mean, we've mostly focused on a little bit more kind of like intimate gathering setting like we have here today. So uh, between our first two events, we had over 1,300 attendees at them, which was a great outcome for us. Um, I think people are really interested in the idea of the use of artificial intelligence and drones. And we've developed what I feel is a really strong platform to bring that to them in an accessible way in involving uh, academia and government partners and kind of all different stakeholders who have an interest in how this develops and making it more accessible to the public. Got it, yeah. And so doing this AI sort of race, and do, do you see kind of the things that you're gonna learn from doing this kind of making its way into the, the, the main DRL kind of platform? What can you kind of learn from, from uh, the AI experience here that might improve the, the DRL experience? Yeah, most definitely. So we've had one of our professional pilots, uh, Gab707, he's actually a PhD in physics. He's been working with us closely across the format, and he's been working with the teams that are developing, doing example flights with them for data gathering. Um, but I think the biggest learnings 
on that side are just repeatability, um, the ability for an algorithm to run the course the same way over and over and over again, which human pilots struggle with. You have a lot of room for error. Uh, with nerves, you know, you're on mm -hmm. camera and in front of thousands of people and you have to keep your hands steady, whereas that's not an issue with an algorithm. It mm -hmm. just deploys the same way every time. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's been the biggest thing. Excellent. I know, um, you know, we talked a little bit about Deep Blue and, and sort of uh, chess algorithms and how AI is kind of taking over all kinds of games in the sport, you know, from chess to go. And so there's a new form of, of chess kind of coming up called advanced chess that pairs, uh, you know, a human operator with an advanced sort of AI program. And they compete against other human uh, operators paired with other, you know, advanced uh, chess programs. And the interesting thing that, that has kind of emerged from that is it's not just the best, you know, human chess players paired with the strongest chess engines. It's really the unique combination of the AI with the human and having the, uh, the human be able to understand and contextualize the AI inputs. Uh, so do you see sort of this AI making the pilots better? They're providing, you know, better navigation or things along those lines that, you know, where that marriage between AI and human produces a, you know, stronger outcome? Yeah. I mean, I this particular platform is more centered around giving the right tools to AI programmers so they can really develop on the platform and, and create better racing technology and higher performance. I think there's a huge opportunity in AI around giving the right training tools to human pilots as well. If they're weak in a certain scenario with a certain maneuver, can we develop custom training scenarios that help them uh, become stronger competitors? Uh, will it help us customize their training plans and preparation plans for events based on prior performance? There's a lot of AI-based analysis that they can benefit from. Um, but I think what we're really excited about, too, is you know, for a very long time, we've had computer players in the digital space who compete against humans who are kind of guests in that space. And now we're bringing computer players into reality. So there may be a future where you can root for your favorite AI, your favorite human pilot, and you may not know the difference. I can tell you right now, and probably for the next two, three, four years, there's going to be a, a discernible difference between the two of them. But there may come a point where you just root for your favorite competitor, whether it's an AI or a human. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, so the, you think in the next you know, three to five years, you might actually have you know, AI being somewhat competitive to the humans. What's, the, what's the, that curve look like for you? Yeah, I think three to four years is reasonable. And there are certain things... Um, that AI might beat humans at right now, certain facets. You know, if I took a very simple trajectory and had an AI run that 50 times and had a human run it 50 mm -hmm. times, I think you would see a higher level of completion on the AI side. Um, but if you go any more complex than that, um, once you kind of increase that navigational curve and the level of computation that has to be completed, that's when we really start to see those divergent paths. Mm -hmm. Could you see this AI as being, uh, you talked about training tools, and you know, if I were to kind of pick up a DRL racer and try to do anything with it, I would crash it immediately. And I, I imagine that's the experience of a lot of people who come to it for the first time. It, it, do you see a, a way that, that AI could provide sort of you know, the equivalent of like, you know, bumper bowling, if you've ever done that, where you could like get used to the, the experience with a, a little higher degree of safety so you're not going to crash it? Is that something that you, know, you, you think might be feasible? Yeah, so you see that to some degree in consumer drones already. You see it added stability features, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a great opportunity for us as a, as a drone innovator and as a company to add augmented control features with stability hold, with different kind of safety um, features and maneuvers, object avoidance, uh, things that can only increase the experience of someone operating that drone uh, that I think are well within our reach with this technology. Mm -hmm. Could you lay out so what the, the, what the next events are for, for AIR and what the schedule for the rest of the year and perhaps next year look like? Yeah, so we have a race in Baltimore tomorrow, uh, which I'm flying out to directly after that. Mm -hmm. This, that'll be our third race. And then we are coming here to Austin. So that'll be our world championship. Uh, where the winning Alpha Pilot team is going to get a $1 million grand prize from Lockheed Martin. That's a pretty good incentive for these guys to keep developing hard over the next three, four weeks. And then we'll see who's really got the, the grit when we come to that race. Well, thank you so much, James, for that. It's really fascinating. And thank you for the time. Thank you.